Hello, boys and girls. Happy Wednesday and welcome back. We've got just a short bit of reading for you today and we're going to finish the chapter that we started on Monday. And this is the chapter where Cimmerine meets the other princesses who are the captives of the other dragons. And Princess Alianora and Cimmerine are about to go and clean the library and see if they can find some fireproofing spells. So we'll pick up right where they left off as they're on their way to the library. Cleaning was much more enjoyable with Alianora for company. By the time they finished dusting and straightening the last bookcases, the two girls were fast friends, and Alianora was comfortable enough to ask Cimmerine straight out how it was she had come to volunteer for a dragon. It's a long story, Cimmerine said, but Alianora insisted on hearing it. So Cimmerine told her, and then asked how Alianora happened to be carried off by Warog. To her surprise, Alianora flushed. I think it was the only thing left that my family could think of, she said, not very clearly. I don't understand, Cimmerine said. It's because I'm not a very satisfactory princess, Alianora said. I tried, really I did, but it started when the wicked fairy came to my christening. Did she put a curse on you? No, she ate cake and ice cream until she nearly burst and danced with my uncle Arthur until two in the morning, and she had a wonderful time. So she went home without cursing me, and Aunt Ermintrude says that's where the whole problem started. Lots of princesses don't have christening curses, said Cimmerine. Not if a wicked fairy comes to the christening, Alianora said positively. And that was only the beginning. When I turned 16, Aunt Ermintrude sent me a gold spinning wheel for my birthday, and I sat down and spun. I didn't prick my finger or anything. Cimmerine was beginning to see what Alianora was getting at. Well, if you didn't have a christening curse. So Aunt Ermintrude told Mama to put me in a room spinning with a spinning wheel in a room full of straw and have me spin straw into gold. Alianora went on, and I tried, but all I could manage was linen thread, and who ever heard of a princess who can spin straw into linen thread? It's a little unusual, certainly. Then they gave me a loaf of bread and told me to walk through the forest and give some to anyone who asked. I did exactly what they told me, and the second beggar woman was a fairy in disguise. But instead of saying whenever I spoke, diamonds and roses would drop from my mouth, she said that since I was so kind, I would never have any problems with my teeth. Really? Did it work? Well, I haven't had a toothache since I met her. I'd much rather have good teeth than diamonds and roses drop out of my mouth whenever I said something, Cimmerine said. Think how uncomfortable it would be if you accidentally talked in your sleep. You'd wake up rolling around on thorns and rocks. That never occurred to me, Alianora said, much struck. Was that everything? Cimmerine asked. No, Alianora said. Aunt Ermintrude persuaded one of her fairy friends to give me a gown and a pair of glass slippers to go to the ball in the next kingdom over. And I broke one even before I got out of the castle. That's not so surprising, Cimmerine said. Glass slippers are for deserving merchants' daughters, not for princesses. Try telling Aunt Ermintrude that, Alianora said. I think she was the one who found out that Warog was going to ravage a village just over the border and arranged for me to go and visit on the right day so I could be carried off. She didn't even warn me. I suppose she thought that if I knew, I'd mess it up somehow. I don't think I would get along very well with your Aunt Ermintrude, Cimmerine commented thoughtfully. Oh, it wasn't so bad, at least at first, Alianora said. Warog ignored me most of the time, especially after he found out I can't cook, and it was a real relief not to have Aunt Ermintrude around anymore. Only then Gornal brought Caradwell, and Zareth brought Helena, and, and they've been making life miserable for you ever since, Cimmerine finished. Why don't you stand up to them? I tried, but you don't know what they're like, Alianora said, sighing. Caridwell goes on and on about correct behavior, and Helena dissolves into tears as soon as it looks like she's losing an argument. And they both had dozens of knights and princes try to rescue them. I've only had two. How do you do it? Cimmerine asked. I've had nine already, and they're dreadful nuisances. 
Alianora stared at Cimmerine, then began to giggle. What's so funny? Cimmerine demanded. Caradwell bragged for a week because two knights and a prince tried to rescue her the first month she was here, Alianora explained between giggles. She said it was some kind of record. You've barely been with Kazul for four weeks and you've had nine and you didn't even mention it when Caradwell was here. She's going to be furious when she finds out. If she wants them, she can have them, Cimmerine said. Her expression grew thoughtful. Maybe they'd be easier to get rid of if I just sent them along to another princess instead of trying to get them to go home. Oh, Alianora said and went into gales of laughter again. Cimmerine gave her a questioning look. It's the idea of Caridwell being, oh my, rescued by a second-hand knight. Alianora gasped, oh dear. Cimmerine's eyes began to dance. I could take a good look at them first to make sure they're worthy of her before I send them on, she sh suggested. It was too much for either of them, and they both collapsed into laughter. You wouldn't really, would you? Alianora said when she began to recover. Send knights to rescue someone else? I certainly would, Cimmerine said emphatically. I mean it when I said they were a nuisance. I wouldn't want to upset Caridwell, though. I'll have to think about the best way of handling it. It's a good thing there probably won't be any more of them for a few weeks. I should have time to figure out something. How do you know that? Alianora asked. Cimmerine explained about the sign and Therindil and her sprained ankle. Alianora was impressed and promised to help if she could. I'll tell Helena that you've twisted your ankle. I know she'll tell the next knight who comes to rescue her. Then it won't matter if your prince Therindil doesn't tell anybody. This settled, the two girls sat down and began looking through the books and scrolls Cimmerine had piled on top of the table. Alianora, having been brought up as a proper princess, despite the tiny size of her country, did not read Latin, so Cimmerine had to explain those, had to examine those scrolls herself. There was a sizable stack of books left, however, and Alianora waded into them with a will. It was Cimmerine, however, who finally found the spell they were searching for. I think this is it, she said, looking up from an ancient crumbled scroll, being a spell for the resisting of heat and flames of all kinds, in particular those which are the product of magical beasts, she read. Yes, there's a list, and it includes dragons. I would think dragons would be at the top, Alianora said. Is it difficult? It doesn't look hard, Cimmerine said, studying the page. Some of the ingredients are pretty rare, but it says you only need them for the initial casting. After that, you can reactivate the spell just by throwing a pinch of dried fever few in the air and reciting a couplet. That's not bad, Alianora said. She came around the table and peered over Cimmerine's shoulder at the faded ink. Is it in Latin? No, it's just an ornate style of writing, Cimmerine assured her. It's not hard to read once you get the hang of it. See, there's the couplet. Power of water, wind, and earth turn the fire back to its birth. It's a variation on a dragon spell, Cimmerine added thoughtfully. How do you know that? Alianora asked. The court wizard at home mentioned it when he was teaching me magic, Cimmerine replied, studying the directions. Then maybe it really will work on dragon fire. Can we get all the ingredients for the initial casting? I think so, but it'll take a while, Cimmerine said. I don't have any wolf spain, and I'm not at all sure about unicorn water. Come on, let's check and see what we have to get. They took the scroll into the kitchen and began hunting through the shelves and supplies. They found more of the ingredients than Cimmerine had expected, and she began to wonder whether one of Kuzul's previous princesses might have studied magic. They did not, however, find any wolfsbane or unicorn water, nor were they able to locate any white eagle feathers. Alianora discovered a very cobwebby jar labeled powdered hen's teeth, but it was quite empty. Cimmerine made a list of the ingredients they still needed, while Alianora changed back into her pearl embroidered dress. Alianora took a copy of the list and went back to her quarters, much excited to see whether she happened to have anything useful in the dusty, disused corners of her dragon's kitchen. Cimmerine doubted that she would find anything, but there was no harm in letting her look. As soon as Alianora left, Cimmerine tidied up the kitchen and put all but two of the books back on the shelves in the library. 
One was the scroll of spells in which she'd found the fireproofing spell because she wanted to take a more careful look at some of the other charms and enchantments it described. The other was a fat volume bound in worn leather with the words Historia Dracorum in cracked and flaking gold leaf on the cover. Cimmerian had decided it was time she really got to work on her Latin. And as I said, it's just a very short chapter today, so about 10 minutes. Uh, but we will be back on Friday for another chapter. Moving forward, we can see what mischief Ali and Nora and Cimmerine get up to, whether their fireproofing spell works, and what Kazool is up to with the other dragons and the wizards. So have a wonderful Wednesday, and I will see you all very, very soon. <laughs>